Well, hello, everyone. I'm Reverend Carla, and welcome to Spirituality Matters, a podcast that focuses on the intersection of spirituality and humanity. Let's settle in and find that sacred space between here where I am and there where you are, and let us be reminded that the holy transcends our physical bodies, and our time together is just as sacred and meaningful as if we were sitting beside one another. Okay, let's get started. This podcast is titled, Take Me to the Place Where Faith No Longer Hurts. And it reminded me of the kind of writings that I did for a season called From My Prayer Bench Writings. And it's, well, first of all, it's cold. So I don't usually go out there in the winter here in Indiana. But a lot of times I would find myself on my front porch with my hot tea And our old senior dogs sitting around me. And this is when I would write, I would, I would do my meditation and my prayers and I get these spiritual downloads, if you will, of these writings, and they would just kind of come all at once. And I would sit and I would write them and there they were. Um, They were more poetic in nature than some of my blogs, but um, the my marketing team asked me to write something about what it means to heal collectively and when i started thinking about it that's the phrase that came up take me to a place where faith no longer hurts and it made me incredibly emotional and sad because i think that for many of us who deconstruct from our religious heritage there is a sense of loss from what we lost in our deconstruction, but also just knowing that we lost our spiritual community. We lost our religious identity. Many of us lost our faith and completely changed who we are. I want to pause here for a minute and say also that this whole deconstructing journey is less about what you become and more about the things that you let go of to find out who you really are and who you are becoming. I think for many of us who are on the the spiritual but not religious path um, and have chosen that as our, our journey, I don't think we ever quit deconstructing. I don't think we ever keep moving towards that which is like uh, not a moving target, but somewhere out there beyond our human understanding. And that feels right to us. That feels right to us instead of planting someplace and saying, this is our faith. And so faith doesn't hurt in this, in this skin of spiritual, but not religious. But it, it took me that, that take me to a place where faith no longer hurts found me spiraling back to moments that were good in church, moments that were painful, moments when I knew I was leaving, moments I knew that I was scared and changing my mind and thinking I'll just fake it in the pews. And that moment when I finally stepped out of those church doors, knowing I would never return. So there was a lot here. And so I'll talk a little bit about that journey today, and I'll also talk a little bit about um, the blog that I wrote that accompanied this, which is very much like the prayer bench writings, and I'm actually going to read it for you um, later. But um, I wanted to talk more about this 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 whole experience of some of the writings that I do because I've I write for the podcast scripts I write for the blogs I write for my content on social media um, I've written in different buckets before in a whole thing called we stories and those were just tiny little life time experiences and those stories are still coming for me, coming for me. So I'm, I'm holding on to those stories to release whenever it, the time is right. The prayer bench stories, Friday's thoughts on faith, uh, things come and go. And I'm reminded of a phrase I heard that the book is complete and the writer can dance. Well, the book's not complete for me. I am in the middle of writing a book now. I know I've shared that and you're going to continue to hear me share that. 
um, until the book is complete and the writer can dance. But that's how I feel. I feel like that sometimes I'm in this bucket for a little while and I write here until I move on to the next. And a lot of what I've written will end up in some form in this book and as my publisher says, in future books. So this is a, a new experience for me and I'm very, 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 very excited about it. So I think that what also came up for me when I was thinking about what take you to the place where faith no longer hurts. Well, why did faith hurt in the first place? What, what showed up? We are talking about healing collectively. Faith hurt us, but why did faith hurt us? Why do people who are put in a position of caring for those that you are shepherding in this spiritual community, why do those people end up hurting those within that community? And the word that came up for me is power. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about here. Oftentimes is power, but it's not just and primarily a lot of times that's coming from a, that, a Christian male leader, because so many of us came from that patriarchal structure that, that had a subordinate nature for women, but that too can be painful, not just from the place of where I can remember sitting in church and trying to reconcile the fact that I'm hearing that I can be whatever I want to be, but I want to be that, which is the minister on the stage and, or at the pulpit. And I'm not allowed to be that because you're telling me that I can't be so this dichotomy in a child's life starts almost immediately inside this these high high control uh, uh, religious structures. But what you find is that also the the not just the powerful men in those positions that are subjecting their their congregants to this power structure, but those who carry the water for it, those who are somewhere beneath that structure, but farther up on the power structure than who you are. And they carry the water for it, meaning that they'll, they know they'll never be on the top, but at least they're not down where you are. And if by carrying the water, which means I am going to acquiesce to this power and I'm going to show them that I am completely loyal, that gives me enough power to wield to those who are lesser than. So you, you start to see inside your religion, inside your family structure, inside your education, inside our government, how this structure has always been there and how it can harm you and why when you start deconstructing from one of those, the house of cards of your reality starts to crumble. Because you can compare and you can see how you have been beholden to a system that at some point, that at some point has its boot on your neck. Now, I know that as a, as a white woman, I certainly have so much more privilege than those who have been historically oppressed. But we also know that in this country, especially that women have been oppressed. We had to fight for our rights to vote. We are constantly fighting for our, our rights to our bodies. So at some point, that whole entire system, if you're not white, male, and Christian, you're on that on that structure in somebody's neck. Or, well, somebody's boot is on your neck. So that all of that came into my thinking about this title for today, which is people um, take me to the place where faith doesn't hurt. Well, we know power comes from a place of, of control and you have to, that oftentimes shows up as hate, but hate actually has a source that its source is fear because I, if I am in that power structure and I'm at the top, well, I'm constantly looking at how my power is being threatened. So I live in a place of my in, of fear because my power might be taken from me. And so you start to build these narratives around those below you to convince yourself 
that only you are worthy to be up higher on that power structure. So when we talk about fear and people fearing what they don't understand, yeah, some some of those who are indoctrinated in it, especially those who are are lower on the on that organizational structure, pa- patriarchal structure, they fear what they don't understand because someone at the top is telling them that you should v- fear those below you who are threatening your rights, even though you'll never get to that top. They're convincing you of this. Um, Andrew Smith is now. This was hard to find as far as who Andrew Smith is and who who uh, who should we give credit to for this quote. But Andrew Smith, I believe, is the one who said it, and he he wrote, "People fear what they don't understand and hate what they can't conquer." You can also see that again. Obviously, we you hear me talk a lot about. Uh, the threat to our democracy. And you can see that being played out in our, in, in the tension that we have in politics here in America right now, but you can also see that across the board. You can also see that where there's almost a disdain for any rights for the historically oppressed. I know in one of my small town USA that I was from, there's a group of people who are starting to try, uh, attempt to try to, to have a pride fest this year. And there are people who are just fighting this tooth and nail and, and being so horrible to the people who just want to be seen. There's no threat to these people at all to make space for this event. But did you hear my language? Make space as if it's their right to give it. But that's the system that we're in. Instead of looking at it from this is a human being who wants to celebrate their gender or sexual authenticity and they want to do so during the during Pride Month by having a pride celebration. It should just be a given that they can do that. Instead, patriarchy says, I have the right to either grant it to you or not. And it's creating this tension because people fear what they don't understand and hate what they can't conquer. Now, I found an interesting article that I'll put in the show notes about eight signs you fear what you don't understand. Because for so many of us, you might think you've got this, you might think you have this all worked out. But let me just tell you this especially for those of us who are um, white, we're indoctrinated into a religious heritage, a high control religious heritage, like the Southern Baptist for me, any, um, any kind of system like that, where you had to, you were required to believe as they did to be accepted. You are going to be coming face to face with the places where your indoctrination lives all the time. And any place where you look at someone's existence and somehow have a judging thought, that's an invitation for you to release something about where you think you have the right to control through your heteronormative standards that is part of your indoctrination, that you have the right to control that and you have the right to judge that. Instead of looking at it and say, well, I don't think I would wear that, but go you, go you. If that helps you celebrate who you are, then go you that shift away from, look at that. Can you believe that? I, I, you know, you, you know, you're there, you know, you're living in indoctrinated belief if it comes out of your mouth or you hear someone say, well, I just don't have any problems with them, but I don't think they should dress like that. That's a, that's a heteronormative standard value that you're placing on someone else based on your indoctrination that you believe that you have the right to do that because of your your comfort level is being challenged. And again, familial, educational, uh, religious, all of those indoctrinations confirmed each other, affirmed that belief that, that, that you had the right to do that. So again, going back to this title, taking us to the place where faith does no longer hurts that can only happen is if we're returning to faith, exploring faith, 
as a better version of ourselves. And a better version of ourselves is one who doesn't believe that we are the gatekeeper of anything. A better version of ourselves says, I am just have a seat at the table of humanity, just like everybody else. And I'll scoot over and you scoot over and then we'll make room for everybody. Because we were never meant to gatekeep it in the first place. Now, going back to this list, eight signs you fear what you don't understand. When you don't want to learn anything new, you're like, no, I don't need that. I've learned all I need to know. I'm 61 years old and I'm still learning. That's what I value most about my being on the spiritual, not religious path is holding on to that, those things that I don't understand right now. There's a stack of books of about 10 that I'm going to try to get through this year and knowing that there's still so much more. I just heard a song um, that's going to be coming out on Spotify. Once it does, I'll, I'll circle back here to pin it in the show notes. And it's written by a, a Gen Zer where she's talking about who do I thank? for who I became. But she's also, what she's talking about there are her collective experiences, including those that were painful. In the song, she's holding her parents accountable for the pain that they caused her during their divorce. But she's come to a place of peace where she can say, who do I thank for everything that happened, for who I have become? Acknowledging those broken pieces in her and saying that because I worked through that pain, I worked through those wounds they caused, that caused me, I am who I am today. So I learned that I was listening to that and I'm like, that's beautiful. And to know that someone who's so young can come to that place where I'm still trying to undo some of the harm that was done to me as a child because I didn't get an opportunity to do that in my young adult life, that gives me hope for the future. So that's a good example of how I think the younger generation knows they have things to learn, knows that they should be diving into this instead of fearing and, and refusing to learn things new. Having a low self-esteem is, is a sign that you fear what you don't understand. And that's going to be um, your 3 a.m. person. And oftentimes that shows up with a really loud ego because you don't want anybody to get near you. You won't take criticism. You won't take critique. You, won't, you don't want to hear any of that because it's too hard for you to process that. But oftentimes... It's that 3 a.m. person that you come face to face with that says, oh, I'm exhausted holding on to this facade, but I got to do it. And it's that facade then that in turn is the one that you show the world that mocks, judges, persecutes, smirks, is condescending, looks down upon. And isn't that interesting if you think about the people in your life who fit that, what I just description, think about them from a place of having low self-esteem, you can start to see the pattern of what's happening there. But this is also an invitation for us to look at our own self-esteem. We are always, this isn't just us saying, oh, let's look out at what everyone's doing wrong. This is what, this is an invitation for us. I'm listening to this. Like I always in this, these podcasts, the teacher teaches what she needs to hear. I am teaching what I need to hear. Okay. Uh, not believing that uh, overcoming obstacles help, helps you grow. Just get over it. You're just so sensitive. I'm not going to go through all of these because I'm already talking a lot, but avoiding new technology, um, those kinds of having a big ego, which I think goes along with self-esteem. And like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to put this in the, in the show notes, but going back to, um, should have put this quote up in the other part, but here we are. Um, it reminded me of something that Lyndon B. Johnson, President Lyndon B. Johnson said. He said, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best, using his terms, colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. This Johnson knew, as most presidents, as anybody in politics do, you got to turn the working class 
against the historically oppressed. They have to work for you. You have to keep them in a place of fear, which is why when you listen to Fox News and those extremist talk shows, they're constantly talking about the threat of immigrants, the threat of these things, because you have to keep them in this state of fear, of agitation, without any solutions. So then they're pe perpetually convinced that this is an ongoing threat to their well-being. And someone is after their precious dollars. Instead of looking at what policies are not policies that the that those actual people are putting in place, like wanting to raise the age of Social Security, that's a thing right now. So that that's happening. So another thought I had, this is just a conversation today. This has been a, this, uh, I'm recording this in January for February's podcast. And um, I, this is the last one for the month. And I've had some amazing conversations. We've been, we we're reintegrating uh, interviews back into our podcasts. And this is the last one. Um, so I hope you enjoy this just conversation with me. Uh, but I'm also feeling very uh, introspective today and wanted to share this from a very uh, deeply personal level because I think the 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 topic really touched me dip deeply. It just it reminded me of where I've come from. And so I'm bringing you along on that journey as we talk about this. But one other thing is i I was invited to talk about what it looks like to heal to be healing. And this phrase come up, take me to the place where faith no longer hurts. I thought of this, um, healing collectively and healing individually are both our responsibilities. So they should not be in a vacuum. Yes, sometimes we have to go into a deep healing season, especially when we've suffered a horrible loss or a tragedy or a major health issue or whatever it is, whatever trauma that has finally surfaced that you're ready to deal with. But looking at it also from a collective experience, not just, not just dealing with our own stuff, not just dealing with our own backyard, but how we deal as a community. And many of us are learning how to do that differently because we no longer are in the traditional settings. And not only that, COVID taught us that there are many ways to find community. When even the most rigid said to physically be in church was the only way that you could be in community. Well, as soon as COVID hits and then we have to uh, have bans on gatherings, all of a sudden it's okay to have virtual gatherings. All, okay, yeah, the, all of, oh, that's okay. God will be there. Even though we've been saying that all along, we've been all, all, always saying that the, that uh, we need to look beyond our limited physical human understanding of what it means to be in community. And I know that it still doesn't take the place of your potluck if that's something that um, interests you or you long for. And we're going to start, we're going to talk about more of that throughout the year because um, I'm actually working on a series called Church at Home and helping people find those collectives inside a smaller collective in, inside your community because people people are longing for that so but but thinking of what we're doing we have a responsibility to heal individually but also collectively not taking a responsibility for starting something but finding people of like minds that can help us be a mirror to ourselves but also we can offer our wisdom to, because hearing someone else's story can be inspiring and healing. And then someone hearing yours can be just the same. I often leave comments on TikTok when someone shares a very vulnerable story. And I'll say, this story is going to save someone's life. Someone's going to see themselves in your words and in, in your video thank you for sharing this because I know that they'll often start the video with, I don't know how long I'm going to keep this up 
because this is really vulnerable. I don't feel, I don't ever do this, but I'm going to tell you this story and how it almost broke me and how I came on the other side of it. And I, if they come across my FYP, I always stop to say your vulnerability and your courage to share it are going to save someone's life. And that's for you as well. Cause I hear people say, well, I don't know what to write. I don't know what to do. Well, you don't have to start a blog if that doesn't feel right. You don't have to have a podcast. You don't have to tell stories on TikTok, but maybe it will be in a smaller group setting where people will find each other. And I believe your story is just as sacred as mine. And mine isn't more meaningful just because I'm out here gabbing about it. Your story deserves to have light. And that's what I mean by this healing collective, whether it's in a, a smaller group in your living room or in the forum. And we're going to talk more about that as time goes on. Okay. So this also pertains to um, your healing journey. And I just wrote a couple of things here. Your journey, your overall healing is contingent upon your willingness to look in that mirror. When you, when something triggers you, when something triggers you, how do we, how do we, how do we go back to the place where faith no longer hurts? Well, we have to take responsibility for our healing. We have to see ourselves in this place of uh, patriarchy has impacted our lives in so many ways. And then we have to take responsibility for it, take response, look for ways that we can heal collectively. And then we have to see that we, our overall healing is contingent upon our willingness to look in the mirror, which means I'm triggered. I don't know what's going on and in, I don't want to deal with it. So I'm going to be mean to the grocer, the gro the person who's checking out my groceries instead of taking responsibility for it. Because a trigger, when you're upset, you've been, you, you've been rattled by something. There's th that is, that is an event, a memory, a wound. Something is asking for light. Something is asking for light. Can you and so it's a the proverbial standing in the mirror to say, I'm ready to face this because I am triggered and I'll either hold on to that wound because it's so comfortable and I've held on to it my entire life, or I'm ready to let light in and let it start to heal. I'm going to let air into it, but I'm going to let it start to heal. So what do I need for that? Well, I might need therapy. I might need to journal. I might need to find my support group again. What is it I need? Just the acceptance alone sometimes can start to see where you think, well, I don't have options. You have options. You might not have wanted to believe that. So you've kept those at bay. So how willing are we to see that? Oh, that's more than just me being offended. This is a trigger. And I'm holding on to something that isn't mine to hold on to. Maybe it's a, an indoctrinated belief, something that was said over you that you're right now ready to release because it does not serve your highest good. So those are things to think about. Giving you a couple of touch points here. We might, I, I might do something with these in social media as well. So one other note I have here is that you will be unsuccessful if you're rushing it. I've been on this journey now. I had been doing work in my 30s and 40s to heal from my uh, abuse from my childhood. But it wasn't until I put it with the deconstructing that I started to see how toxic patriarchy had been for my existence. That that came along with me to finish the healing of that. And you know, I always talk about healing or I try to in a, in a present form, because I don't think it's something that we are, we are, we're ever completely done with. It's just like any other part of our lives. We're healing, we're growing, we're learning, we're moving. When we, when we decide that we're stagnant and we're planted, that's where we're immovable and we're rigid and we believe that nobody has a right to take us from that place. But when we say, well, just as humanity is evolving 
and becoming and changing, I too want to evolve and change. Then it's a different, it's a different access. Uh, it's a, it's a different accessing what's deep inside this is this, if we believe there's some kind of indwelling presence in us that contains the God light, Christ consciousness, the holy, the divine, whatever name you have that, that expresses this divine love, this God, then, then we take responsibility for it by saying, okay, I'm not going to rush this. This is going to become my life, my life journey. And through this portal of, 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 being committed to be on this healing journey, I will discover new things. I will discover new people to be, to bring along with me and look at it from a place of wonder and curiosity instead of, okay, I just need to get this done. Check it off my list, right behind my grocery list, right behind getting my car washed or whatever. It's not that way. It becomes more of who we are. And then we're acceptance. We accept the fact that who we are now isn't who we're going to be five weeks from now, five months from now, five years from now, because we're going to con continue down that path. So we're not going to rush this. It's, it's who we are. That's why when people talk about, well, what am I going to reconstruct to? I am not answering that question for you, beautiful soul. I am not answering that question for you because if I do that, I am no better than that evangelical pastor who told you what to believe, how often you needed baptized, how, because yes, some of us have been baptized more than once, how often you need to come to church, how much you need to tithe, not doing that. It's less important about what you're reconstructing to and more important about what you're committing to as far as your journey from this point forward. I think people still want to think, well, will I go back to church? Sure. Why not? Well, will I become spiritual, but not religious? Hmm. I don't know. Isn't that exciting? But will I become agnostic? I don't know. What's wrong with becoming agnostic? It simply means that you're questioning things. It doesn't mean that you're denying anything except that you're saying, maybe what I knew wasn't quite, we, we, we missed the mark on that. And I'm open for new understanding. And I'm going to continue to question. I'm not going to take anybody's word for it, that this is the way it is. And my favorite thing about uh, saying it being about agnostic, because I would say that's what I am, is that I'm not going to let thousands of year old text written before they had heard anything about the technology that we have now and, and how much humans have evolved to today where the things that we know about science and medicines and the human condition, they had no understanding of that those writings, somehow I'm held chained to those as my spirituality. That is absolute nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. And the writers of that text did not mean that to happen. I firmly believe that. And, and then ignore all the wisdom teachers that have come before that to continue to move us. It was a story that was planted at that time and was to continue to move us through our humanities changing and evolving. That's how I describe it. So I'm going to end now with reading to you my blog um, because I want to and I think somebody's going to um, this is going to mean something for someone and then um, we'll close our time out together for this final podcast for the month of February take me to the place where faith no longer hurts it wasn't supposed to be this way from the very beginning, we humans have gotten it wrong. Survival of the fittest evolved into the survival of the whitest. The expanse of time between the two bookends of our becoming aware to our becoming awake holds wars. 
subjugation, domination, annihilation, and rationalization for it all. The toxic stench of patriarchy permeate, permeates the air, fouling the most serene of landscapes and the most majestic of ocean waves. At every turn where we could have chosen different, we chose control. At every moment where we could have chosen compassion, we chose violence. At every crossroad where we could have brought humanity along with us, we chose greed. There is no God that would ever condone any of this. No matter how many times you contort ancient scripture to fit your narrative. No, this God was made in the image of those who needed to justify horrific acts of oppression. All for the glory of humans in power. I want to believe that good will prevail. I want to believe that justice will be done. I want to know with a certain degree of certainty that children of every color, physical or mental capacities and background will have a better lived experience than their ancestors. I want to know with 100% certainty that as Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. quoted and President Obama had imprinted in a rug in the Oval Office, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I want to see all the people rise up and change this broken system, heal the lands, and love everyone with a ferocity that can only be found when you truly believe in Jesus' words to love your neighbor as yourself. I want to believe it. Was it naivete or wanton ignorance that prevented me from seeing the way the world truly is, with its power-hungry patriarchal structure that simply will not take its foot off the neck of the oppressed? Is it stubbornness that keeps me from giving up, or is it hope? Either way, I awake to another day, vacillating between my own bookends of extreme fear and unrelenting hope. Hope for what? That goodness will indeed prevail. The kindness and compassion will be the banner under which we will live. That we will collectively rise up, heal what's broken, and work together to elevate the human condition and leave the world a better place because we were in it. I want to believe it. It is Rumi who delivers the most eloquent of words for this season of humanity. A mystic who lived hundreds of years ago understood that in order for humanity to escape the paths we were choosing, the paths that had built a power structure which demanded the historically oppressed to remain forever oppressed, that we see one another through the eyes of God, not the eyes of God we had created to justify our bigotry, the eyes of God that can gaze upon another and see that we are they, that God. Any other God is a figment of the imagination of the powerful. Rumi said, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, languages, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. That's Rumi. I'll meet you there, beloved. Come, come to the field. Let us awaken, heal, and work for the good of the whole. I'll meet you there. Blessed be. Thank you for li listening, beloved. You can find the show notes wherever you are listening to this podcast. If you'd like to watch the uncut version of today's episode on my YouTube channel, then subscribe and check back often there for new content. Please check out the Patreon to show to join the Numisoul membership and ac access unique opportunities, including the, our weekly live streams and bonus content. I also invite you to, of course, connect with me on social media. You can find all those links at my website at RevCarla.com or at Numa Soul Center for Spiritual Transformation at NumaSoul.com. Okay, Tier Ones, I'm honored to be in this space with, space with you. I pray you receive something 
I know I did because the teacher teaches what she needs to hear. And now, beloveds, go in peace and be at peace. Go in love and may you be loved. Go and know that others are on this journey with you and you are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved just the way you are. Blessings on your week, and I will see you soon.